Okay, so in this tutorial, we're going to be looking at ISO 27001 Annex A 515 access control. A couple of changes that came in with the 2022 update of the standard. We're going to go through those. What um, we're going to go through what those are, and we're also going to give you the implementation guide so you know what it is that you're doing it, so that you can satisfy it when it comes to your ISO 27001 certification. So as I say, a couple of changes. Bear with me. We're going to go through those. Then we're going to dig into that implementation guide. So the definition of this, the definition of uh, 515 is rules to control physical and logical access to information and other associated assets should be established, right? So we want rules on how we're accessing physical, logical data, assets, whatever it is that we may have. The purpose of this particular control, it's a preventive control that ensures authorised access. So we want to make sure we've got authorised access and we want to prevent uh, unauthorised access to information and assets, right? Common sense, really. We only want the right people with the right access to the right data at the right time. This is about giving the right levels of access to data. So let's go through what the changes were. There were some changes within the 2022 standard. So ISO 27001 NXA access control changed with the 2022 update to the standard. It introduced the requirement for a topic specific access control policy. Yes, I've got one. Go on the High Table website and have a look. It took the 2013 version subcontrols of A9.1. Uh, 9.11, uh, 9.12, and it collapsed them into one control. And with the 2022 changes, the concepts of different access control methods was acknowledged for the first time, right? So we're looking at different access control methods, it acknowledged them, and the level of granularity of access is now explored. So we're looking at the granularity of access with an, accept, with an acknowledgement of the security cost trade-off and the freedom for an organization to choose based on risk and business need. Right. So this, again, is re-emphasizing 27001 is a risk based model. Right. It's not a rule based model. So it acknowledges that things are not as black and white as it may have believed in the 2013, 17 previous versions of the standard. Gives you a lot more flexibility. So let's go through the implementation guide. The control of access to information and other assets is going to be require a topic specific policy. So we need that topic specific policy on access control. There's a blog on how to write one. There's a blog on what it should include. There's a template you can download, but you're going to need that policy, right? So make sure you've got that access control policy. Once you know that you've got the policy, right, we've got to go away and create our data inventories, our asset inventories. We've covered this again, you know, in previous blogs. To get to this point, we've already identified what our physical assets are, what our data assets are, what our virtual assets are, what are the assets within our organization that require us to protect them. So we're going to get those asset registers. So check out those guys, tutorials, blogs, videos and templates. So once we've got that, then we need to implement access control. And uh, to do that, we need a classification scheme. So we've got an access control policy. We've got a classification scheme that classifies our data and our assets. We've got a data asset, physical asset, virtual asset. We've got asset registers of all of our assets. We know what we've got. Now what we've got to do is put in the controls about how we are going to protect that. So this is where we're looking at implementing access control rules by defining and mapping access rights and restrictions to relevant entities. Here you can see entities. We're not necessarily just talking about people. Again, the standard has evolved, right? There are things within our environments that require access and not all of them are human beings, right? So we need to know what those things are and then we're going to map those policies, procedures and accesses that they have. So, you know, humans... But we've got services, we've got devices, we've got machines, we've got things in there that are going to require access. Considerations when we implement access control. Let's look at considerations when defining and implementing access control rules. Working on the principle of least privilege, which means we restrict access to everything unless needed as opposed to the principle of everyone has access to everything, right? So if you haven't heard this before, the principle of least privilege, that's what we're going to be working on. Remove everything and only grant people what they need to do their job. Don't give everybody access to everything. Smaller organisations, right? Startup organisations, this can be a challenge, right? These chaps and ladies and people and groups like to give access to everything to everybody, right? Anyway, it is what it is. Uh, account for automation in process and technology where permissions are changed automatically, right? We need to think about whether or not our systems processes, our digital processes are automatically changing things. We're going to implement a review of the approval process, at least annually, or based on significant change. We're going to make sure our approval process is 
fit for purpose and operating as intended. So we'll review that as often as is needed based on your size. It's important to show ensure we have a consistent approach to access rights. So we're going to put in a process about how we grant that and revoke that, uh, how we change that, how we you know change passwords and things that go associated with that. So this is about process maturity. We want to be consistent in how we approach it. Everybody does it the same way within our organisation. Physical perimeter security, we're going to take a consideration of that if it is appropriate to us, right? If we've got physical uh, offices, we've got you know, data centers, things that we need physical access to, not everyone does. And we touch on that, how you can handle that um, in terms of the standard. But if you do have that, we're going to make sure that access is appropriate and consistent with access rights. Who can access it? When can they access it? Records that they accessed it? How do we revoke their access to it? What happens when somebody leaves? Physical, pure, physical perimeter security controls will be put in place if we have them. And where dynamic access control is in play, consider the factors and elements on how they and how they can be reflected, right? This might be, you know, your systems and processes, you know, um, grant admin, remove admin, you know, whatever it may be, various levels throughout the day, you're going to understand that and document that and make sure that you're all over that. So what are the steps in implementing access control, right? When we're implementing access control, we're going to establish and communicate a topic specific policy and access control. We're going to complete all of our asset registers and make sure we know what we've got and what we need to protect. We're going to complete our classification policy so we know what levels of classification we've got and the handling that we expect for all of those levels of classification. You're going to decide on your methodology for access and your approach to access and then you're going to implement it, right? Let's have a look at some implementation principles, really, access control principles. So the principles, you know, the Mainstream, really, you know, you should have heard of them. If not, let's go through them. Need to know. So a need to know, the principle of need to know is the principle that you grant access to the information required to perform tasks and duties. So this is, again, restricting access to those that need to know. You've got a principle of need to use. Need to use is a principle of granting access where a clear need is present, if somebody needs it. So the difference is subtle and barely material in that you grant access to what people need, right? Need to know, need to use subtly different you could say they're very similar they are very similar you're not going to be quizzed on that right they're not going to quiz you on that but just to know at this stage that those are the principles that they're we're working to when it comes to access control there are various methodologies right what are the access control methodologies no one is right no one is wrong you know work with your technical teams work with your experts you know the kind of methodologies that you've got you know uh, mac mandatory access control DAC, discretionary access control, RBAC, role-based access control, ABAC, attribute-based access control, many different methodologies that you can go through there. So at the beginning, we talked about the standard now introducing access granularity. What does that mean? Well, let's have a little look in a little bit more detail at access, of, uh, access control granularity. So the level of granularity of access is based on your business and business risk. It's a wide range with examples of covering networks or systems all the way down to restricting access to individual fields. So you can see, right, you can restrict access as broadly or as specifically as is appropriate to you. You can consider factors such as location, how people connect, who connects, teams, individuals and people in there. It has a direct correlation on cost and security, right? The more granular you are in access control, the more it's going to cost you in terms of technical, physical, monetary cost, you know, resource cost, but proportionate to that, the more secure you're going to be, right? Ideally, the more secure you're going to be. So the more granular you are, the more cost you'll incur in time and resources, but the more, more secure you will be. The less granular you are, the less cost in time and resources, but the more insecure potentially you're going to be. The art is finding the right balance for you. So this is about granularity. So how are we going to comply? Complying is doing the how, right? So to the what, get the policy, get the asset registers, complete the asset registers, get the classification policy scheme in place, you know, decide your control access methodology, implement your control uh, methodology, uh, and you're going to be absolutely golden. When it comes to the audit, what they're going to check, they're going to make sure the end does something stupid, right? They're going to make sure all the documentation is in place. You've got all of those asset registers. You know what you got. You know what you're controlling, that you put in your implementation. And they're going to check that implementation to make sure that you're following it. You know, they might work through recent hires to make sure that, um, that the process was followed for granting access. 
They might look at if you've got role-based access control, how you've defined your roles and then an implementation to make sure the implementation matches that role. So just make sure that you haven't done something stupid and they're gonna check that you've got rules, processes and that you've followed them and you've trained people. So the biggest gotcha here is having people with access that is left, right? We don't want to make sure that we're following our processes and we don't want access in our environment come the, well, at any point, but definitely come the audit of people that have left because they're going to check, right? Check your global admins. Is the global admins in there? Was the person getting access to confidential data? Make sure you follow your process and tidy all of that up. What are the mistakes people met? Just said it, right? People have left the business, but they still have access. That happens. Third parties have open access, right? Again, granting a third party access to your environment, you're gonna have rules and procedures for that, ideally based on need and ideally time-based, right? You're gonna grant that access for the time they need to, to, to do the job. But one of the things that we see is, you know, third parties, we've just open-ended access into an environment forever and usually using generic accounts. So anybody in that third party organization can get access in. This is typical of things like support departments, support teams and IT teams. So just check that. Be aware of that, you know, if you have to have that, make sure you're covering it through risk management and there's a risk item and you've accepted the risk of it. And if not, get some handle on it and get some control over it and just make sure that all your documentation clearly across the environment is up to date with the right version control, recently reviewed, approved, uh, and you're gonna be absolutely golden. Okay, so that's about access control. What's the principle here? Just consider about who needs access to what, grant them the access that they need for the time that they need it and remove it when they don't putting checks around um, auditing and reviewing the access methodology around the authentication, like the approval process. Let's review how we approve those levels of access. Uh, make sure that the process, if we have roles and role-based access control, let's review that on a regular basis to make sure that it is still working and it's still efficient and it's still operating as intended. So my name is Stuart Barker. I am still ISO 27001 Ninja. We are working our way through the 93 Annex A control, so stick with me for the next tutorial. But for now, you are going to be good to go. Access control in the bag. Peace out.